Now the fun begins. M6, garage door opener. The reason that this project is fun is because everybody understands a garage door opener. A residential garage do door opener has one button and when you push it, it does what the control system thinks you want to do next. If the door is down, you push it, it goes up. If you push it again, it stops. If you push it again, it either goes back down or continues up. Most likely goes back down. With one button, you don't have as much deterministic control. An industrial garage door opener, however, has at least three buttons, up, down, stop. And then that means we can use stop for other things too. So we're, we're going to go into this garage door opener project, M5. There's a bunch of different parts to it. It won't all be just one lab project. So uh, let's just get started. Basic PLC programming with the Micro 800, the next lab project in part one, second edition, M6, M for Micro 800, M6 garage door part one, beginning on approximate page 109. This is our garage door layout. And the reason that we're using a garage door is because it's the one process, if you want to call it a process. It's the one application for control that everyone has some exposure to. You could go out into your garage right now or your neighbor's garage if you don't have one. You can look it over. You can see the door segments. You can see the other housing, the track, the chain, the lamp that comes on when you uh, interrupt any of the buttons on the garage door opener or the garage door itself. So these are all the elements and we show two choices for control. We will not be exploring the alternative up, down, stop, where you use one button and you keep track of the last thing that you did basis where you're at. We're going to use the primary, which has an up button, a down button, and a stop. The other key things to understand here is that it doesn't matter where you place those two limit switches as long as they interact by contact with the moving door when it is in the up position and the down position. So you'll notice that one limit switch, that's actually the down limit switch. When the door has traveled all the way down, there's a ramp that comes in contact with the arm on the limit switch and trips it. Likewise, when the door is all the way up, it trips limit switch 2LS. Typically, these two limit switches aren't even in view. They're inside the housing for the garage door control so they can't be bumped or broken and you would never want your limit switch for the down position to be down on the floor and have the garage interact with it when the garage actually reaches the floor. That's just asking for problems with tools, brooms and other things banging into it, getting caught in it in a typical garage. It's, it's bad enough the photo eye with the reflector has to be. Now it doesn't have to have a reflector, it can be a through beam can be transmitter receiver. Nonetheless, the optical path for that safety photo eye has to be down around ankle level or so to sense anything laying in harm's way uh, of the travel of the garage door. So this is our garage door. We have a motor that's reversing. We have a lamp to illuminate the garage. We have two limit switches to tell you that it's up, down, or in between. If neither is tripped, then it has to be in between. We have a safety photo eye to say the path is or is not blocked. And then, of course, we have up, down, and stop switches. If we throw up a graphic here of a schematic diagram for a garage door opener, this is just a real simplistic example of a garage door opener that is electrically controlled, that is no PLC, no microprocessor, just straight up relays and switches, including the timer. Down there, third rung from the bottom, 1T, that's a timer, and it has a contact that you can adjust with time based on the timer being initiated by 1CR-3 and 2CR-3. So, the first thing you do in a control system is you have to have things to make it safe. Well, obviously the stop button. So no matter what it's doing, if it's moving, we need to stop it. And if something's in the way, we need to stop it. So these two elements right here are the primary starting point for this system. If it's moving, you have to stop it, whether it's because you want to stop it or something you can't see needs to stop it. Then, of course, we have limit switches, two of them, 
one for up and one for down, and notice that they are normally closed. I mean, they're normally closed. When the garage door reaches LS1, it opens it, so it can't go up, or if it reaches LS2, it opens it. This is fail safe. Now that we can protect people and protect the garage door motor and the garage door itself, then let's add an up button and a down button. Now the up and the down button are going to control the motor. That's a single motor. I show it as two, two circles. In reality, it could be one circle with three leads, a common, a forward, and a reverse. Okay, and actually, if this were an industrial garage door, those could be motor starters. A reversing motor starter has two, and if it's three phase, one of the phases is reversed on one contactor than the other, and that's how you get your forward and reverse. That's one motor, controlled by two starters if you like, or if you want to say it's a 115 volt motor, and that's what we're running through those relay contacts, then it's just one motor with three leads. That also leaves us with the light. Now we've covered all of the components that were on that diagram for a garage door opener. Now, if you want to consider how this circuit works, currently it's at rest, and one of those two limit switches would have to be tripped. Now, if the garage door is down, then LS2 is tripped and open, so you can't go down if it's already down. So if you press the up button, that has a complete path for current flow, through to CR-2, and that is a preventative for you trying to make it go up and down at the same time. And I'm not gonna go through all this. Uh, you look it over, and if you don't understand this electrical diagram, you better stop right here and spend some time considering it. Otherwise, the program won't make any sense when you write your program. All of these lab projects and discussions come from the first two manuals you see on this page, part one and part two, of the fundamentals of PLCs using connected components, workbench, micro 800 controllers. As we continue in these lab projects, I'm not going to show you every single step. If I think there's a new step that I haven't shown you before, a new process, a new procedure, I will step through that. But for what we're going to do right now, you've already done most, if not all of this. What I did was I took M5, the last lab project that we did, I saved the project as M6 Garage Door 01. You could just save it as Garage Door and then just keep using the same project without any name changes all the way through all of the four, five, six projects that involve the Garage Door. However, if you wanna be able to go back to different points in your procedure, in case you want to redo things or relook, then I would save each one of these as 01, 02, 03, and so forth. Do something so you can kind of split them up. I made mine 01. Now what I did was I went in and created six new, actually 12 new tags or variables in the global variable database, Boolean type, IN00, 12345OUT0, one, two, three, four, five. Now these are individual Boolean variables. They're not bits of an integer or a double integer. They are individual Boolean variables. An advantage to this when it comes to aliasing, and I'm not gonna delve into that in depth right now. But here's the procedure that I did. I just went in and created those dozen variables. Then I went to buffer inputs, the very first, and brought it up. Now see, I've started here. Now I also deleted IN and OUT, the integer variables from the global variables database. And notice having done that, now you get the little I'm not happy sign up there. And I did one because remember, I already have these here, okay? Here's these dozen tags, variables. So I can go here and backspace to N and I can see it right there. Backspace. And that takes care of my input buffers. My input buffer, I'm buffering the state of the screw terminal passed through the optical isolator to memory during the input update scan to these bits of memory. So these now become my inputs, not these. I went to the output and did the same thing. Only we're changing the permissive, not the final screw terminal for the output device. So here I can uh, click on it, put my cursor after the last character, backspace twice, and there's output zero. 
and you need to repeat this for all six rungs. Now you see I have it for all six output, the six outputs that I'm buffering. So these are now my output bits that I'm going to use in my program. I'm not going to use these. Actually, these are easier to work with, and there's some other benefits that you're going to see shortly. The other thing that I did, and I did it right up front rather than doing it piecemeal, is again, I went to the global variables and I alias. Now, the difference between what you see here and what you see in the manual was, in the manual, I had not deleted the two integer variables in and out, but we're not going to use those, so I went ahead and deleted those as soon as I saw them. It won't make any difference in your plaid lab project whether you deleted them or not. So now I'm going to del I'm going to put in an alias for each one of these. One other thing I want to point out is that I may turn around and change the alias on these inputs to put them in an order that I prefer as far as the priority of inputs starting with zero going through five. The reason for doing that is to give you the experience of going back and changing an alias so you see it's not permanent. You can change the alias offline anytime you want. Now we have the aliases assigned to input 0 through input 5 and outputs 0, 1, and 2. Notice 3, 4, and 5 do not have anything currently. The next thing that we had you do was to go into your sequence and re-associate these instructions with memory locations. They, for the most part, sorted out to the same location, but now you see that the um, aliases pop up with the primary or the base tag all the way down through output 5. So we change, you know, the OUT dot whatever to just straight OU200102. That was the next thing we had you to do then. I had you save and download. Save it. But before we download, we have to turn on the simulator. Rather, it says, I said turn on really at start the simulator, which means instantiate its presence in RAM of your computer. There it is. We'll bring it down here and it'll be slightly out of sight. We want to turn it on. We can't download to a controller that doesn't have power on it. So we turn it on. See, we have power. It's in the run mode. And now we are going to download. Okay, here we are downloaded and online in the run mode. And the only reason that we had you do the edits to the sequence is to give you some continuity. So it's the exact same logic. Keep in mind that in the manual, you only have four outputs, zero, one, two, and three. It stops right here. So we kind of doubled up our six inputs into those four outputs. But remember, we're doing this with a simulator. So if I want to run this, I go down and turn on input zero, and it shows up here. Turn on input one, turns on both motor up and motor down. Well, that's not good. But remember that this logic has nothing to do with our project. This just gives you some continuity between what we did in the last project. We kind of brought with us the buffer input sequence, buffer outputs format. We changed the buffer inputs and outputs over to the version that I prefer, and that's bit by bit. In other words, I'm not using elements of an integer because elements of an integer are sometimes very difficult to alias or maybe not even possible. So this is the method that I use. Remember, you can do copy, multiple, paste, and edit these rungs very quickly. Then I had you save and disconnect. Now in the manual, step 21 was missing on page 100 and 115. It should say 21 and it should say save and disconnect. That got left out. My apologies. So I'm going to, and I'm going to leave this running. I'll turn off the inputs because remember this is a controller now. CCW doesn't know the difference between this simulator and an actual controller out there plugged in with ethernet into your ethernet port. And that's in the run mode right now. So I'm going to save and disconnect. And now I'm going to delete all but the first rung. I just select it and hit delete until everything is gone that I want gone. The next thing that I did was drag in a branch around and I put it right here. Okay, and it jumped around the down limit switch. Now remember these IO assignments are not correct. And we may even change these several times in the course of this lab project. Rather than making a project or a program absolutely spotless and perfect, I like to have a few things in there that force us to do some edits because this is the way it's going to happen in the field. No one writes a program of any real value in the, and then find that everything was absolutely perfect when they ran it the first time and that was it and they walked away from it. The closest I ever came in my whole career was a device net network, big one. And that was back when device net manager was the 
graphical user interface for editing a device net, not RS Networks for device net, which is it, which it is now. And I had this huge network, and I configured it all, downloaded it, and then it came up with some things that weren't working. And when I went and looked, that station with its remote device net interface and everything was not powered up. And when I powered it up, it worked. That scared me because I've never had anything go that perfect before. So we do leave some errors in here and there. We don't back up and take them out and then start over and you don't know, you're none the wiser. I leave them in and I change them later and explain why. Okay, so we put in a branch around. Now you could go over here to toolbox if you want and pick a direct contact. We'll grab it as long as we're there, drop it in here, but we could have grabbed it from up here and dropped it down, which you're going to get used to using this more than using this because this is less involved. In this case, I want to use output zero here. So I'm going to type in O-U-T, didn't take, O-U-T, double click. Now I have the rung to match what we had in the manual. Now in the manual, that's not exactly, it's not a perfect match, but I'm not going to change it. Now if you want, I will change it. I'll change this to three and this to four and the rest of it is okay. The reason it doesn't matter right now is because we're just going to, going to demonstrate this logic, but the logic is not relevant yet to our actual application. Now, I don't feel compelled to follow the manual 100%. Sometimes I like to deviate from what's in the manual to demonstrate other things that aren't in the manual. Then I had you um, save and download, download with project values, Download is complete. Change the controller to the remote to execute controller project. That's always going to pop up if you left the controller in the run mode when you disconnect it. If you leave it in the program mode, this doesn't come up. It's going to assume you want to stay in the program mode. Now, notice that I increased the size of the cursor because I realize it might be hard to see. If you're watching this on a cell phone, oh my goodness. <laughs> That's a real challenge, but I guess if you got good glasses and good eyesight, more power to you. Then I had you exercise this. One of these two has to be true. Now typically the stop push button, that's input three, so we'll click on input three here. Notice how our buffering has worked. This is not IN03, it's underscore IO underscore EM for embedded and underscore DI for digital input underscore 03. That's what I turned on. But because we have, we're buffering our inputs, this turns on to fully represent the state of that screw terminal as far as high or low. Now, in order to get the motor on, one of these is gonna to have to be true. Now, since these both use the same address, when you see stuff like this, this is called seal in logic. You are sealing in the state of this rung with this contact from the load. This could be a relay coil and one of its relay contacts is used right here. So for the up push button, I'm going to turn that on. The whole run goes true. Then I'm going to turn it right back off. So that's like pressing and releasing the up push button. So the motor runs until you go to input three and turn it off and then back on. Remember that all of our stop or safety devices are going to be wired fail safe, which means that they conduct electricity in the safe mode the fail safe mode. That way if a wire gets broken, everything stops and you can't start it. So whenever whenever we do a project with this type of logic, it's not going to run right unless you turn this on right at the beginning because this is representing a normally closed push button which would have continuity to the screw terminal, high voltage at the screw terminal. When I say high, I mean the high logic state, probably 24 volts DC, goes through the opto isolator and during the input scan, it updates that bit in memory, this bit right here, IO embedded DI3, and then when you run the buffer input program right here, scan it, it sets that bit high. A question in the manual, does output zero remain illuminated? Well, this is what we did. Okay, we, um, well, you can't toggle that on. That's my want to do that. So let's turn on four and right back off, and it stays on. So the answer was yes. Does output zero zero remain illuminated? Then it says toggle three. Okay, but we're not toggling it from an actual controller. We're toggling it right here in the sense that we turn it off and right back on. That demonstrates dropping out the motor. So this is a traditional start-stop circuit. It has a start button, a stop button, and it has a load. And the load has an aux contact that seals in the momentary push button. Save and disconnect. And then open the global variables. 
And notice that I had already jumped ahead and did some of this work. So I already aliased some of these. Now, remember I mentioned something about readability or clicking on the head. If I go up here and click on name, that rearranges everything in that column based on alphanumeric order. Okay. If I do it on alias, now see they're all kind of scattered around because it's based on characters in this column. So I, I prefer this myself. And notice it puts it in order of input zero, input one, and so forth, out zero, one, two, three, and so on. So that's what I showed you there. Then I said save all input switches in the opposition, download, and open the sequence. So I'm going to turn, make sure all these are off. Then I'm going to save and download. Download with project values. In this case, uh, this is kind of out of sequence with the manual, but since I got you here, I'm going to go ahead and turn on input three, which is the stop push button. So right now the stop push button is not pressed. Normally close push button. It's not pressed, so it's on. The input is on. Then I turn on input four momentarily, right back off, and that notice you could hardly even see this change. So let me do the stop here real fast. I clicked on that. I double clicked on three. So now let me double click on four. One, two. So whenever you're going to operate these momentary push buttons, make sure you double click on the screw terminals down here to get them to operate properly. Then I had you disconnect and make some changes. Save if you like. Disconnect. And then I changed the aliasing. This was input three, stop push button. I don't want input three, the stop push button, which means, and on the top of that page 117, at least in second edition, maybe not in future editions, it shows you how to change or what to change based on the inputs. So there were two columns, the old and the new. So input zero one went from being the down limit switch to being the up push button. So I'm going to do that, open up the global variables. I'm going to make these changes. Now let me warn you of something. And that is you cannot just change these to something that's already used down here. For instance, input zero is going to be the stop push button. Well, if I put in stop push button here, the software is going to complain because I've already used that. So what I'm going to do instead is I will click on that and then I hit delete. I'm glad I made this mistake. I just deleted something I did not want to delete. Now back up to put it back in. When I clicked on this, I wanted to delete stop push button, not delete the whole variables. If I had done it right here, then I could hit the delete key multiple times and then input three is going to be PE safety. But you see, I can't put that in either because that's already used up here. So we've got here, delete, and now input zero, I want that to stop push button. And I want input three to be the PE safety. Input zero one is the up push button. I can't assign that because it's down here. I can delete it though. Then go up here to input two. Well, that's the, actually that's gonna be the down push button. So I'll just delete both of them and then go up to input two. Input three is PE safety. Input one is the up push button. Now you see that I have uh, changed all these to match what's in the book. Now in the book, the were still out of order in the column. It was input one, then input zero, then two, three, four, five. So input zero is stop push button. Input one is up push button. Input two, down push button, input three, photo eye safety, and then four and five are down and up limit switches. Now notice I changed the text. In some cases I used all uppercase D-O-W-N, and then I had limits spelled all the way out, and some cases I spell switch all the way out. In other cases I use uppercase S, lowercase W, or just uppercase SW for switch. Now it should have been its limit switch limit switch. See, they do match. So it's a good idea to stick to the same nomenclature in one program. Don't vary it within a program. In other words, I wouldn't have L-I-M-I-T, S-W-I-T-C-H here, and then only have L-S here, because L-S. Okay, save and download. Download with project values. Notice I made changes to the inputs, so I have stop push button and up push button. This one's okay, motor up, 
output zero zero. Save and download. Download with project values. Again, this is the same logic. We just have different tags or variables associated with the instructions. It still works the same way. Input one now has to input zero now has to be on because that's the stop push button. So if we momentarily toggle input one, we're going to turn this on. So watch this again. I'm going to double click input zero zero or I'm going to double click zero zero screw terminal. Wow, I did it fast enough that you didn't even see this change. Let me try that again. We'll double click zero one. See, you didn't even see this change state, but now this is true and it's on. Double click zero zero. So you didn't even see it. I'll do a little bit slower on then off. Now you can see it. So the logic remains the same, functions the same. We're working with three bits in memory here. Two of them happen to be actual I.O. input devices, two push buttons, and then we have an output device that is either a starter that's going to run the motor in the up direction or it's a direct connect for 115 volts. And once again, I want to mention that this represents a normally closed momentary push button. And if it's a normally closed push button and it's not pressed, then it's passing voltage to this screw terminal and it's on. If you press the button, it goes off and then when you release it goes right back on. A question in the book, can the true if on output zero ever be true before the wrong is true and the output instruction sets the memory location to on? No. There's no way to make this wrong true without first turning this on. And we do that by turning on input one. And the exact sequence is when this goes on, that energizes that bit in memory and then on the next scan it reads that it's on even though this is false because you let go of the button and it keeps it on. So the answer was no. I had you do input zero on first and then, oh, I'm sorry, and then zero one. So really, if I hold down the stop button, turn on the start push button, nothing's going to happen. But then when, when I release the stop button, then it's going to go on. And if I release this up button, the start up, um, the circuit stays on. If you were to press the stop push button, will the true state of the wrong drop and cause the output instruction to set that memory location of OUT00 to off? Well, of course. Yes, yeah, so we'll double click input zero. And that's exactly what it does. So these, these are obvious questions, or rather I should say the answers are obvious. There's no trick questions. The questions are designed to make sure that you drew the proper conclusion. With your rung in the above state, that would be what you see right here, and without using the switches connected to the I.O. terminals, that would be 0 and 1, can you think of another means to energize the memory location output 0, 0? Yes. Now, I can go here, toggle, and it's on. It doesn't. If this gets on, then this is going to be true and it's going to stay on. I can do the same thing. I can toggle it here, too. It doesn't matter which one I toggle. It's going to have the same thing because I'm not toggling the logic here. When you right click on this stuff and toggle, you're not toggling the logic or the instruction. You're toggling the bit and memory. So whether I do it here or over here, if I right click and toggle, I'm toggling OUT00 in memory, not this instruction. Did it matter which instruction you chose to toggle? Nope. Is the This is the classic momentary start stop rung of logic. Do you think that it would matter what order we put in the start and the stop instruction? No. In other words, if we move the stop push button over to here and put it in between this ORD set of conditions and the output, it wouldn't make any difference because it's, it's ANDed. It's this and this, and that's the same as this and this. It all works the same. It's in series. Now, I had a, um, in this state right here, we'll toggle this off. I ask you how many instructions are true? Only one, this one right here. And then does it operate identical to the previous before you move the stop, stop push button instruction to the right? Well, we didn't actually, I didn't do that. You did it in the lab. In other words, you move this over onto this side and then ran it again. Doesn't make any difference. It still runs the same way. Make the edits, try the logic. Does it operate identical before you swap the two instructions ORD? So you make the edits. Does it operate identical to the previous before you swap positions the two instructions ORD? Yes, it does. And that was where we swapped.
Truifon up push button with motor up push button as we just swap these around so this one was on top and that was on the bottom. Doesn't matter because the way the logic reads it reads from left to right top to bottom. As long as it can find a true path over here it's going to turn on that output. And then the last question you know, what I had done was temporarily toggle that on and I ask you how many instructions are true? Two. This instruction is true, that one's true, and this one is false. That was the end of the lab. Not the end of the garage door, though. We've got many, many, many things more to do on the garage door. This was just kind of an introductory into the ceiling logic and to a rung of logic that used momentary contacts to run the motor or not. Okay, the takeaways from this lab project is the traditional start-stop circuit. Momentary contact starts it, momentary contact stops it. Now in the real world, the stop button is wired normally closed. That way if a wire breaks, it's not gonna run. It, fa it fails to a safe position, which means that the normally closed push button, the stop push button, is going to put a 24 volt DC voltage on the screw terminal for its input, meaning then when the button's not pushed, the input is on. So when you push the button, the input goes off. So we did the traditional start-stop circuit, so you learn how to branch around, and that concluded really the uh, part A of this garage door opener. We'll see you for part B.